Good morning. The Department of Children and Family Services and our community partners are working towards common goals for the well-being of children. Last July, after a number of focus groups with our private partners, with foster parents and youth, and with consultation with national experts, we created a rapid response plan to set many priorities for the year ahead. One of our top goals was to reduce the number of children and youth in residential placements. In fact, since then, we have returned more than 340 youth to community placements and family placements from deep end residential treatment. That has allowed us to cut in half the number of youth waiting in emergency shelter and detention. That means that we are at the lowest utilization of deep end residential placement in Illinois in the last seven years with improved outcomes for those youth. But we must remember that our goal is not just to reduce our utilization of residential treatment. It is to improve the lives of these youth. So we will track the progress of those youth returned to the community to assure that they're safe and that their well-being is actually improving. We're also piloting therapeutic community-based foster homes as another alternative for residential treatment. By relying on professional foster parents who have backgrounds in things like nursing and social work and others, we can give these young people the home setting they really need. Doing the right thing for kids is ultimately our most important goal. I know this new direction has meant some difficult adaptations by providers of residential care, but I will tell you that they've responded in constructive ways and we will continue to work with them to make this transition. Change is always difficult, but this is the right thing to do for our kids and for our system. So it is important that we do this in a transparent, deliberate fashion so providers can actually plan for the future. We've also undertaken a dramatic change in the way our frontline investigators and case managers work with a refreshed model for practice that is built on best practices identified by professionals and experts across the country. You see, we know more about child development now than we did 10 years ago. And we'll know more 10 years from now than we do now. We know now that the impacts of trauma and adverse childhood experiences impact children. We've learned that 80% of brain development occurs in the first five years of life. All this new knowledge must improve our practice moving forward. We've also learned the importance of training, particularly experiential training. We now have, for instance, on the campus of the University of Illinois at Springfield, a simulation house where frontline staff can get additional training in how to respond to real life situations, both in homes where they're conducting investigations and in courtrooms where they're actually seeking judges' orders. As we intensify our focus on children's well-being and restoring families, we have to remain vigilant about safety. So starting on Monday, and every day after that, review teams in quality assurance will review investigations involving children identified as being at the highest risk of experiencing a fatality or life-threatening episode. These teams will be engaged with the frontline staff as a sort of second opinion to be sure that we've fully assessed danger signs and have set the right case plans in place. Our rapid response plan also set us on a course of transforming our data systems to create data that's readily available to our frontline staff and to those who assess our overall performance. This is a long road, and we've only just begun the journey. But the safety and well-being of our children demands that we put together tools, and we put those tools in the hands of our frontline staff, literally in their hands. So we're beginning to roll out mobile devices for investigators and case managers to produce their paperwork. These devices will allow pictures and notes to be taken in the field and uploaded automatically to our databases. Less duplication, less paperwork will allow workers to focus on that which is really important, working with families and protecting children. 
as a consequence of initiatives begun in this department and in other departments throughout state government. The governor in January announced an HHS transformation agenda, coordinating the activities of 12 state agencies. I've never seen this kind of cross-agency collaboration before. For instance, it's the first time that I've ever seen corrections and education at the table, as they should be, when we plan for health and human service improvements. This is truly an unprecedented degree of coordination and cooperation among these agencies. And we're now focusing that on the vexing problem of behavioral health. Behavioral health needs touch prisons, juvenile justice, child welfare, education, Medicaid, health care, economic self-sufficiency, and more. The more we've learned about child abuse and neglect, the more we realize that it's deeply rooted in mental health and substance abuse. The more we look at our prison population, the more we realize that prisons have become our largest mental health institutions. Our goal is nothing less than to be a model for the nation in how to effectively manage prevention and the treatment of substance abuse and mental health throughout the population of Illinois. Why is this so important? Well, several reasons. Behavioral health problems drive two to three billion dollars in costs across Illinois every single year. We see substantial opportunities to derive better value and better outcomes from the money we spend. These challenges are on the rise in our population. And from a purely child welfare perspective, we estimate that 45% of children needed but did not receive mental health services. That's more than twice the level for adults. So this week, Directors Norwood and Shaw, Secretary Davis and I, met with legislative leaders of both parties in Springfield. We let them know of this coming transformation and that we are now preparing to formally ask the federal Medicaid system for a statewide waiver, known as an 1115 waiver, to allow us the flexibility and the funding to pursue this transformation. As we develop the framework for that waiver request, we will learn from past requests by the state and from successful efforts in other states. This will require a significant amount of stakeholder engagement and input. So we will need all of our community partners to give us their thoughts and their suggestions. We'll, you will hear more about this over the next few weeks as we develop a more formalized process for input. We in this department have also been planning beyond this period of rapid response to a five-year look at what we need to accomplish and how we'll accomplish it. The governor wants us to be no less than a model for the nation. And we want a model that is not just for other states, but for, for private health insurance coverage and mental health and substance abuse and other behavioral health issues as well. It's not often that you see state government as a model for private industry. But that's our ambition. See, this is not a partisan issue. It is not a conservative or a liberal issue. Mental health and substance abuse issues afflict Democrats and Republicans alike, young and old, rich and poor. We know from clear evidence that a substantial amount of crime and poverty is driven by the problems of mental illness and substance abuse. If we can do more to prevent, to identify, and to treat those problems, we we'll actually make our communities safer. We'll reduce the cost of assistance programs and help people turn their lives around and become more productive and self-sufficient citizens. As we move forward in planning that huge undertaking, we must do our part in the child welfare system, where the trauma of abuse and neglect creates and exacerbates behavioral health problems in children. I met the other day with one of our private provider agencies whose history goes back more than 100 years to some of the first orphanages. That was our model of care then. It was more or less assumed that children in orphanages and foster care would remain there until adulthood. Federal dollars were actually distributed on the basis of how many children were in care. So providers actually lost money 
if they successfully restored a family or reunified children with their biological parents. Illinois began changing that in 1997, and much of the nation has now moved away from that approach as well. And as we focus more on reunifying families and encouraging things like adoptions and creating other permanent connections for children and youth, we've learned so much more. And we have so much more hard evidence about what works in helping children overcome special challenges, including abuse and neglect. So Illinois is going to immerse itself in the lessons we've learned and enlist the entire community and their resources in doing the right thing to serve our vulnerable citizens. The children and youth who do not have parents, who parents who can actually give them the proper care they need, and sometimes parents who abuse and neglect them. This turnaround is something we've agreed to do in the federal court consent decree. But it's also a good thing for children, and hopefully will be a model on how we enlist the resources of a community in a cooperative way to improve the lives of children. We will enlist judges, law enforcement, and other stakeholders, as well as the front line of the department and our private service providers. Today, I'm announcing the first of four of what we are calling immersion sites. That has nothing to do with baptism or swimming. This initiative enlists government and private agencies together. For far too long, we've largely operated separately. These immersion sites envision a coordinated approach to protecting and helping young people in cases of abuse and neglect. These pilot sites will drive a coordinated approach in these communities with more local control and coordination. And we hope to eventually expand this across the state. We've made a commitment to the federal court to do this. But more important, we have a commitment to our children to do this. You see, all knowledge does not reside in Chicago or Springfield. It is in the communities who know their needs best. When we take ownership of the welfare of our children, it's ultimately the children who will benefit. We've chosen these initial sites in part because they want to be among the first. And they've shown a spirit of common purpose that I think we really need to test this comprehensive model of, care, of child care and learn from mistakes before we roll that out gradually across the state. We have the capabilities and the commitments we need to make a pilot program successful and pave the way for many more to follow. The initial sites will be Lake County, St. Clair County, Rock Island and its adjacent counties, Mercer and Henry, and finally the more rural area surrounding Mount Vernon in the counties of Clay, Hamilton, Jefferson, Marion, and Wayne. Directors of these immersion programs will report directly to the senior leadership within the department. We intend to have these sites ready to go in August or early September. Many other areas of Illinois have expressed their interest in becoming an immersion site. Rest assured that we'll be rolling out a second cohort early next year. So continue to work with us in anticipation of that development. This brings me to the matter of a strategic plan to guide prevention and improvement in child welfare system of Illinois for the next five years. Everything we are doing must be guided by a vision and by evidence of what really works in the programs that protect children and keep them on a path to self-sufficiency. And let's them share in what Thomas Jefferson called the people's self-evident right to the pursuit of happiness. Planning for the future is important because it brings all our stakeholders together to talk about the biggest challenges and how we address them together, with everyone pulling together. This department has had seven directors in the last five years, and every director seems to have gone in a different direction. Our system is almost as traumatized as our kids in care who keep being moved suddenly from one home to another. I'm trying hard to break that curse. So I want us to have a plan that is so embedded in the mutual commitment of everyone in this system 
that it takes on a momentum of its own. As I've said before, we know there's going to be change, and change is never easy. We sometimes go along comfortably doing something one way because, frankly, it's comfortable to do that. And then we're asked to shift and learn different ways, but we have to learn that from what science teaches us. We're not doing this just for the sake of change. We're truly looking to apply the knowledge of people who studied these challenges and collected data for many years. It is time that government, like the private sector, focuses on what really works. A draft starting point of a strategic plan will be posted today for public review and comment. And it is just that, a draft. You see, we cannot make this work without the full engagement of all of the entire community, from the people in the department, to foster parents and birth parents, to professional service providers, and yes, to youth themselves. I want you to help us fill in the details, the priorities, the challenges. The response to our planning and to all that we have undertaken has been extraordinary. So many providers, for example, have come to me and said, we understand where the system's now going and why, and we want to adapt to that change. We have tremendous leaders and organizations in Illinois in our child welfare system, and we need every one of you now more than ever. So we're working hard on this plan, not because there's some rule that everybody needs a five-year plan, but because we need to look around corners and understand the challenges and make sure we've taken advantage of the strengths of our system. We need to inject innovation into our system. We look forward to working you, with you in the completion of this plan. Once a strategic plan has been finalized, we will convene a summit in early fall somewhere in the center of the state. We want people from out the system, from investigators and case managers to leaders of our provider agencies, from lawyers to judges, from foster parents, birth parents, and guardians to youth to come together and talk about where we want to go and how we're going to get there. We've come a long way together, and we have so much more to do. But what we've done gives us the confidence that we can truly accomplish so much more. We speak in terms of programs and funding, but our real priority is children and families. Children and families of this state who need us and rely on us. We can give them services, but what we're really providing is hope. You see, when people lose hope, they really have lost everything. And the sense of hopelessness spills over into the ge next generation and into the rest of society. So let us fundamentally inspire that hope. Hope for independence and self-sufficiency. Hope for a more loving and successful family. Hope that these kids and families can overcome what has afflicted them. We can break the cycle by working together. Thank you for all that you've done, and thank you for joining us on this journey for the children and families of Illinois.